say that the title that's in your program has a typographical error in it. Now, it's not the fault of any of the organizers here at TEDx. It's the fault of the speaker not proofreading her title before she sent it in to TEDx. But I want to correct it because it's an incredibly important point and a message that I want to get. And it's a simple little correction. One letter, the letter S. And if I want to leave one message with you today, is that we have one ocean, and it supports the life that we know and value on this planet. Our fate, in one way or another, depends on the ocean and its interaction with the atmosphere, the land, and us. Now, the, the ocean plays a critical role in our climate system. It helps regulate water, the cycles of carbon, and the cycles of heat. It actually, if you look at the patterns of temperature and precipitation on our land, that also depends upon the chemical and physical balances in the ocean. The ocean feeds us. It cycles nutrients. It basically harbors biodiversity, processes waste. It holds vast stores of mineral and petroleum, things that we most covet nowadays. Um, it actually has a, it provides transportation for goods globally. And it provides recreational, aesthetic, and cultural resources that we value. Now, you've been sitting here looking at this slide, I hope. Okay? And my guess is that when you first looked at this slide, you focused immediately on the land masses, where we live. Okay. I'd like you to now focus on the ocean. And many people will look at the ocean like they look at the continents, as distinct geographical features, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, with very limited connectivity. But that is false. Okay. The ocean is connected through the thermal hailing circulation, which is shown here. That thermal hailing circulation helps mix heat, chemicals, physical properties, chemical properties of the ocean globally. And it is what furthers um, our knowledge about the connections between the physics of the ocean and the biology of the ocean. This particular animation, you probably can take a look at and see. What you see, of course, is the identity of the, the Gulf Stream that you can probably see that's there down in Florida and that is going up the eastern seaboard. Okay? But take another, and of course, that Gulf Stream is very important, particularly in England and Northern Europe, because it helps provide warmer climates than what we would have normally without it. But as you see that Gulf Stream move off into the, the northern Atlantic, you see how it meanders and it breaks up into what we call little eddies? And what they're doing there is mixing hot water from the tropics and colder water from the north. Likewise, something similar is happening down there off the coast of Patagonia. These regions where you see all this mixing is very important for the physics, chemistry, and biology, because these are regions where some of the most productive fisheries exist in the world. Fisheries that basically are protein factories for feeding the world as well as the organisms within the ocean. Now, despite all of this, despite the fact that we have one ocean, it's a dominant planetary feature, covers 70% of the Earth's surface. We know very little about it. It was only in 1979 that researchers at the Oceanographic, with the help of the submersible Elvin, discovered the hydrothermal vents deep on the ocean seafloor. Just recently, we were surprised. They, they, they we're still finding surprises about these hydrothermal vents. Just recently, we discovered three separate new hydrothermal vents in some of the deepest water, 16,000 feet. The hydrothermal vents are exciting because they bring up minerals deep from the Earth's interior. And those minerals, combined with the chemosynthesis property, produces the life form that you're actually seeing here. Life forms that do not exist from photosynthesis, but from chemosynthesis. It is believed that the hydrothermal vents are places where life on this planet gains its first early foothold. Why are we continuing to be surprised about the ocean? 
Well, in many ways, the ocean has only been systematically studied since about 150 years ago. This is a picture of one of those first expeditions that were mounted, the HMS Challenger, done about 150 years ago. You know, and at that time, they were probably really excited on that ship, just like we are when we go out into the ocean, our researchers. They were going out using the latest state-of-the-art technology and thinking, boy, I'm going to unravel the mysteries of the ocean. That was then. And since then, since World War II in particular, technology has developed rapidly that allows scientists to get into the ocean in new ways. And this particular figure just shows you some of the platforms that we have to use to get into the ocean to study it. Certainly, satellites are part of that picture, but satellites can only measure the surface. We have profilers, moorlings, um, un, un, uh, uh, cabled seafloors, um, remote occupied, uh, operated vehicles, gliders, etc. And that's still not enough. We have new sensors that measure biology, chemistry, and physics all together. But what's even more exciting and that could be transformative in the way we understand the ocean is the building of ocean observatory networks that is occurring, beginning to occur now. Networks that take all of these platforms and sensors and take measurements 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This will open up our eyes, new eyes, for observing what we see in the ocean as a system. Why is this so urgent? From a scientist's point of view, it's urgent because the human impact on the ocean has grown. It has grown significantly, as shown in this particular animation, that bright, warm colors are a measure of human impact in the ocean, the cooler ones are lower impact. And you can see, of course, that a lot of the lower impact regions are in the polar regions or in areas which are inaccessible for us to get to. We will be going down to the Antarctic soon this year to actually look at the spread of invasive species along the seafloor in the Antarctic. Perhaps when we come back, the color on this graph may be a little bit different. We will see. We are changing the planet on a global scale. And in fact, Paul Crutzen has said that the Holocene era, that's the geological era that has been attributed to the last 10 to 12,000 years, has now ended. It ended sometime in the 19th century. And we've entered a new geologic era, an era called the Anthropocene, where it is named after the dominant change force on the planet, and that's us. This is obviously a, a diagram that talks about the infusion of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that top graph that shows there, it's the increase in carbon dioxide, which is increased by a third, a factor of a third over, uh, uh, by a third over the pre-industrial Holocene era. But not only is that infusion of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere inducing warming on the planet, it also, is inducing major chemical changes on a global scale in the ocean. And that bottom curve shows what's happening in terms of the pH, which is a measure of the acidification of the ocean. The ocean uptakes carbon from the atmosphere. When that carbon dioxide enters the ocean, it dissolves, it becomes more acidic. As the upper layers mix with the lower levels, the pH decreases and you have a more acidic global ocean. Now, why would we worry about this? Well, we worry about this because biological species, coral reefs, shell-forming organisms, are critically dependent upon a balance that depends upon the pH of the ocean. And on the right there, you see that animation of a sort of model going through from the year 2000 to about 2100. It shows what we think will happen right now uh, given the knowledge that we have to the coral reefs and shellfish that we have in our ocean. Obviously, red means that their saturation state is approached and exposed shells and skeletons are likely to dissolve. All right. That increased carbon dioxide is also having an important component in warming the earth and particularly in regions that have heretofore not been really explored by humans or haven't had much of a human impact, critically the Arctic. The melting of the sea ice 
and the uh, glaciers in there have obviously reduced the ability for the polar bear, for example, to actually feed successfully. What we don't know is what's happening at the opposite end of the food chain. That food chain where the algae and the microorganisms that are sitting in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, how are they going to be impacted? And how is the food chain going to further impact the uh, biological structure, biological ecosystem that we have in the, in the Arctic? When you look at the Arctic what, and the melting of what's going to happen there, you say, okay, resources are going to open up. And right now, one can be concerned about what's going to happen in the Arctic. Are we going to really treat it like another gold rush where we go off after resources that perhaps should be protected? The Arctic is not like the Antarctic where the Antarctic is protected by international treaty. So as we go forward, we will be seeing what happens into the Arctic and whether there was a big flashpoint of conflict associated with those nations who think they have sovereign rights over those resources in uh, the Arctic Basin. This mindset, the mindset that the ocean is a limitless resource, really comes to fore when you think about how we take resources out of the ocean, particularly fish. Now, I'm going I'm to pick a little bit here on, the, on this diagram, which is, is really the Japanese fleet. It's talked, it shows the Japanese fleet, the progression of the Japanese fishing fleet from 1950 to 1980, after World War II. And, and I don't mean to pick on the Japanese fleet, because a lot of fleets will have the same patterns that you're seeing here. Okay? And there's two things that should come to, you should see. First of all, that after World War II, the fishing fleets have actually gone into every corner of the ocean. Okay? In fact, we are taking fish out of every corner of the ocean. Secondly, if you look at the colors, which is the fish caught per 100 hooks, you might say, well, we're catching fewer fish. Well, that's not because we've gotten poorer at catching fish. Okay? It's because there's fewer fish. All right? And in fact, over these last 50 years, nearly 90% of the large predatory fish, those at the top of the food chain, have decreased. Decreased by 90%. Okay? And so we're taking fish out outer lower parts of the food chain and more of them. Where is this food catch going? Okay? If you look at the statistics of where the food catch is going, it's going into the stomachs of wealthy nations. Okay. In a recent study, nearly 90% of the world's fish catch from all over the world ends up in the United States, Europe, and Japan. Think of the profound implication that is for management of fisheries, for the feeding of developing countries, and, and for basically world stability. The ocean um, has also been a, a dumping ground. It's been a dumping ground for a continental runoff of things like fertilizers. Um, it's been a dumping ground associated with the fact that we have billions of people on this planet right now. I'm going to show you the example here of just one type of pollution. You probably have all heard about the Pacific garbage uh, dump in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Most of it is plastic. Plastic that comes in from winds uh, off the land into the, the drops plastic into the ocean, or for rivers discharging uh, plastic into the ocean. When it gets into the ocean, it's obviously taken up by currents and um, eddies and stuff, and eventually can swirl into little uh, select areas. But those areas are widespread. It's not just the Pacific that has these garbage patches. The Atlantic has them. Other places have them in the in the in the ocean. Um, and what happens with these is that wave action works on this plastic and catalytic processes, and it breaks up the plastic. And what I have here is just a little video of some researchers that have gone out to ex look at what this plastic looks like. Um, so you can see the plastic that's, that's um, actually um, being shown here. And you can see the tiny, how tiny pieces the plastic actually end up. And you sit and you have painstakingly counting these pieces of plastic. On this particular cruise, we actually, they actually this looked into a fish and discovered through, uh, in, the, um, in, in their stomach, 50 pieces of plastic. 50 pieces of plastic consumed. Now think about this. We eat these fish. Are we eating our own garbage? 
along the way. Okay. Now, we're all familiar with what's happened in the Gulf. Is the Gulf a turning point? These are some scenes from the Gulf. Certainly, the Gulf represents a very small part um, of the ocean. But what, uh, unlike Las Vegas, what happens in the Gulf may not necessarily stay in the Gulf. Okay? <laughs> and you should get that in point by now. We've been very fortunate in the Gulf situation by the eddy currents that have been established have kept and confined some of the oil. But what we do not know is this the oil spill, like all other spills, is very different from each other. And we learn from these oil spills. They are opportunities to learn. What we do not know what is going to happen inside the ocean. Because this particular oil spill was unique in the sense that it deposited great amounts of, of oil in the water column, not just on the surface. This is, a, is this a turning point in the Gulf? Is this a point in time where we have a clarion call for the ocean? What will the ocean look like 50 to 100 years from now? It may very well look like this, okay? That's if we use the eyes that we have right now, all right? But there are other eyes that we can look at, and we can be doing things to move us forward and being a more interactive and important uh, sustainable relationship between us. First, we need to explore more, using new eyes, new observation tools, things that we haven't even thought about, putting them in networks so that we understand how the ocean works as a system. Secondly, we need to discover, we need to continue looking at the discoveries that show how we as a human species interact with this wonderful piece of our planet, how the life helps us is, is formed using things like proteomics and modeling and simulation and information systems. And finally, we need to think about science, sound science-based planning, management, and protection of the ocean. Thinking about creating ocean reserves that serve as insurance policies for the future. We've seen this landscape many times, okay, for many generations. It is time, perhaps now, to look at it deeper and with new eyes. Thank you. <laughs>